Thank you all for joining us for our first big in-person event in quite some time. We've all been through a lot over the last couple of years and it's really truly wonderful to see um, lots of smiling uh, familiar faces and uh, new faces as well. This occasion marks the 15th anniversary of the Scottish Institute for Policing Research. It's our 10th Scottish International Policing Conference and it's the 50th anniversary of the James Smart Memorial Lecture. So we thought we'd make it a special one. A huge thanks to Monica, don't run away, um, who has done so much to make this happen. She is the brainchild between, behind everything uh, that has gone on to make this such a special event. Um, thank, huge thanks to Simon, one of our postgraduate coordinators, who's really stepped into the breach to help Monica with making a lot of things happen in the last number of weeks. Thanks to Denise, who's our uh, conference chair. Thanks to all the presenters, the contributors, the museum staff who've been fantastic and all of the providers who are here providing various functions to us for truly making this a really special and I hope memorable occasion for everyone. I can't promise we'll do this every year. This is the result of three years of conference budgets coming together so don't get too accustomed to it. Just, just enjoy it, enjoy tonight, enjoy tomorrow. So, um, we're here tonight for the James Smart Memorial Lecture. This was founded to perpetuate the name of a distinguished policeman who became the first Chief Constable of the City of Glasgow Police in, 1962, in 1862. His grandson conceived of the idea of having an endowment fund to commemorate his grandfather. Tonight's um, wonderful event has been made possible due to the James Smart Lecture Fund and its purpose, which we must remember tonight and I hope we'll, we will fulfil, its purpose is to promote the widening and deepening of police thought, highlighting research uh, which contributes to the wider understanding of police problems, practice and experience and I believe that that's what we're all doing collectively as a cyber community across academia and practice over these two days. The inaugural lecture was given in 1972 and since 2011 it's been incorporated into the Scottish International Policing Conference. So tonight we are honoured to have Andy Rhodes at QPM to deliver the James Smart Memorial Lecture. Andy is the service director for the National uh, Wellbeing Service, Oscar Kilo, so his mandate really fits with the theme of our conference which fits with our third strategic priority research theme in Cyper. Andy's last serving role in policing before uh, retirement uh, was Chief Constable of Lancashire Constabulary. For 10 years, Andy was also the NPCC lead for wellbeing and staff engagement and organisational development. Anyone who's heard Andy speak uh, before will, like me, be thoroughly looking forward to hearing what he has to say, even if he is keeping you from your dinner slightly longer. So over to you, Andy. Right on cue the microphone because uh, I do tend to move around a lot and there's nobody sat there. So I'll, uh, it's a real uh, privilege for me today to um, come up here and do this lecture. I have done talks in all sorts of weird and wonderful places, but I don't think I've done any, a talk in anywhere as spectacular as this. It's a phenomenal venue, so well done for putting it on here. And um, I do think that, you know, the title of my uh, speech tonight is uh, We Asked for Workers and They Sent Us Humans. And I read that many years ago and it resonated with me because my talk tonight is all about how research and practice can translate into real change. But to enable change, particularly cultural change in an area like mental health and well-being is very challenging in the culture that we work in. And I think one of the things that we do often forget is the fact that we are putting humans in contact with other humans in often highly stressful situations. And the one thing that I, uh, I've listened to an audio book recently, it's uh, quite a new thing for me, I'm getting into these sort of things. 
uh, by Malcolm Gladwell called Talking to Strangers. I don't know if anybody's listened to this, but I'm saying to a lot of police leaders and police officers and police staff that I speak to, it's really worth a listen. Because I didn't realize that in his book, Gladwell focuses a lot on police officers and the public and their interactions. And the audio book is worth listening to because he plays real footage of body-worn video and interactions. He also goes deep into history and the message that he gives out in his book is that fundamentally we think we understand other people and the cues that they give to us when we're having an interaction with them, but actually we don't. We don't know as much as we think we do. And he talks, uh, particularly one of the things he frames the whole audio book around is the tragic case of Sandra Bland. Uh, if you've heard of the case Sandra Bland, uh, which I'd sort of heard of, but not in detail, it's, it's a case of a 28-year-old young black woman who was starting a new job at a university and she was pulled over by a Houston State trooper. And that interaction went terribly wrong. There was no guns drawn, but she was arrested eventually for a minor traffic infraction. And she was sent to jail for three days, and after three days, she tragically took her own life. And he keeps coming back to this interaction all the time and talking about what actually went wrong. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about those sorts of issues here tonight. Um, I think the whole purpose, really, of uh, James Smart, as Liz said, is to deepen and widen policing thought. And I think one of the things that when I came into this area of organizational development, I thought I would be talking about primarily was making sure people didn't go ill, making sure absence management was okay, you know, sort of optimizing the resource. And what I'll put forward tonight is a very different picture. I'll put forward a picture tonight that says the data and the research that we are now getting that we didn't have 10 years ago is telling us all sorts of interesting things about the major policing challenges that we've got in this country and internationally. Because there is, it is putting us in the minds of those people who work in the police service, and it isn't just in this country, it's across the world, how their work affects their interactions with the public, how it affects their health, but particularly how it affects trust and confidence. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more as I go through. <clears throat> One of the things that I always felt, and um, Ian and I were chatting about this, is you feel very, very policing is one of these 24-7 outfits that's whirring away seven days a week, 365 days a year. And it's, it, it, you can feel very reactive. So even as a chief constable, you, you know that what's happening on that day can take over and dominate your thinking and sometimes leave you insufficient time for reflection and pausing and looking at the wider picture. And that's why I, th I think the um, SIPR, the GLEFA, events like this are really important because it gives us a chance to stop. And I think because of that, sometimes we've overlooked the fact that demand and the nature of our work has changed beyond all recognition in the last 20 years. I say we, it's not that we don't know this, it's that our organizations sometimes haven't adapted to keep up with that, particularly in terms of how we recruit and support and train our people. And the other thing is that we have fallen behind other sectors in our adoption of the latest technology and data solutions to help us. This is a big issue for us, and I'm gonna focus on those two things. And to do that, I'll sort of talk about the National Wellbeing Service as a journey, because, um, we didn't have a game plan for this, it's been very iterative, but what we have been able to do is go, in policing terms, very rapidly from a PhD of an individual, who Emma and I know very well, through to a fully funded service that costs probably three million pounds in a sector that's 16 billion, but punches way above its weight. And is very agile and is able to do things and turn it into actual policy and now legislation, um, uh, you know, far quicker than we ever envisaged it could do. And so I'll look at two things. How do we look at other professions, put our egos to one side and look at other professions that do very similar work to us and some of the practices that they have adopted for a long time that are evidence-based and help them, uh, particularly in their day-to-day -day interactions with their clients. And the second thing is, 
what is happening out there in terms of new technology and how can we accelerate policing into some of these new solutions that are uh, commonplace now in uh, a lot of other sectors. Along the way, just to keep you interested, because I'm conscious that I'm keeping you folks from a haggis and a Cayley, which is a position I never thought I would ever be in. I've been in some very dangerous situations in my career, but never stood between, you know, a Scotsman or a Scotswoman and their haggis. So, um, to keep you interested, I will explain how a fashion store, not far from here, George Street, I won't name the fashion store because I don't want to be sued because I'm being filmed, but it's one that's very dark if you go in there with any of your children, you can't see around it. What that global fashion store could learn from the Burma campaign in 1943. Yeah, I shall also talk why, why Swedish biotech geeks are yet again ahead of the curve. Nordic people always seem to be ahead of the curve, don't they? Um, I'll talk about social networks and how to outwit the hierarchical nature of some of our big organisations. And I'll paint a picture of, uh, hopefully put ourselves in the minds of the individuals who are out there at three o'clock in the morning trying to keep us safe. And at the end of this, if the technology works, because I am talking about us getting better at technology, so I hope the clip works, I think it will. There's a very short video at the end of this which brings together a lot of the things that we're talking about that we're going to be using in Oscar Kilo. So the National Wellbeing Service was set up in 2015 and I think this is really important for people in this room because it was actually founded on the basis of a PhD. Um, you know, uh, it was, and that PhD was founded on the principles of organisational justice. So for the first time ever, what we got an insight into was a really deep dive piece of research into some of the things that we'd intuitively already know, always known but had sometimes ignored and that was a that was a pivotal piece of research because it, it stimulated the MPCC and other people to say look we need to start looking at this and we need to set up some sort of working group to have a look at the mental health of our staff I mean who'd have thought you know in the job that we do that we needed to do that and so that's what we did and we started with a very sh um, small grant from Public Health England, set up a website, started with a working group and took it from there. What we didn't realise was there would be an amazing thriving um, academic community across the globe looking at exactly the same things we were looking at. And I cannot underestimate how the advocacy of people in key government positions, advisors to government, can really accelerate some of the work that you do and also those international uh, relationships. And so those, those, those jurisdictions, law enforcement, whatever you want to call it, blue light communities are a thriving group of academics who share their research. Generally speaking, if you find an issue, there will be somebody who's done some work on it. And where there are fully armed police forces, of course, the stakes are far higher. That's on everything through to some of the organisational justice work through to suicide prevention. And so <clears throat> we've now got a operational outfit that's got 10 vans that does tens of thousands of health checks a year. We've got dogs, training guidance, and we've got a national survey that was agreed for all forces to do um, that, is, that is independently evaluated. It's based on the principles of organisational justice. And the agility of the National Wellbeing Service is based on its networks, uh, not just inside the service, but outside the service as well. So if you want to influence the HR community, uh, Prof Sir Professor Sir Carrie Cooper is the person who will influence your HR community. If you want to influence government policy, Dame Carol Black is the person who will do it. If you want to influence the whole service, the Police Federation, the Superintendent Station, Unison, these are our partners. And so I cannot underestimate that this is a great subject matter to engage and build trust with those groups of people on. You will not find any of those groups who do not want to talk to you about this sort of thing. Um, it's a separate issue to some of the other things that we engage with them on. Um, so, you know, a brand that's different because nobody wants to talk to their organisation about mental health, nobody wants to talk to HR about mental health, there's still a huge amount of mistrust. And what we've seen, <clears throat> are there any NLP practitioners in the room? I'm not an NLP practitioner. 
Come on, you can admit it if you are, it doesn't matter. You know, your NLP practitioners talk a lot about inner and outer journey. And uh, that is one thing that I do sort of like find quite interesting because what happened in society and in policing, because we reflect society, is that the cultural attitude and, and destigmatization of mental health has accelerated way beyond the transactional side of the job. Its structures and systems are not, nobody is coping with this opening up of a discussion around mental health. And that same is the same as in policing. So the cultural uh, discussion around mental health is generating a huge amount of pressure in our system and it's no different for policing. And I think our role now is very much to provoke and support the service to make sure this ethos of organisational justice remains true um, to what we're trying to achieve around wellbeing. I mean, demographics <coughs> and destigmatisation, by 2024, 40% of all police officers in England and Wales will have less than five years service. So by 2000, in another two years time, 40% of police officers will have less than five years service. If you roll that into the response function where most people start, it's probably 70%. That is a difficult landing zone, folks, for new people, many of whom are under 25 now because they're studying for the degree. And we know that there's NHS Digital have just done a piece of work that says up to one in six, six to 16 year olds have got a probable undiagnosed mental health disorder. One in six, six to 16 year olds. And what we're seeing entering our workplace is a new generation of people out of 130,000 police officers in England and Wales, probably 60,000 coming in over five years. So almost a 50% turnover who have a very different expectation around what we will do to support them in their mental health. So every global company that I speak to is trying to turn that into an opportunity to create a mentally healthy workplace. And that's where I come from. <clears throat> so organisational justice and the clothes shop, I nearly said the name then because I've got it written down here, the clothes shop on George Street. Nearly caught me out then. Could have been penniless the rest of my life. Uh, my daughter did a degree in Edinburgh and she studied for sculpture uh, at Edinburgh University. Uh, despite my suggestion that it would, might be difficult to find a job for a sculptress, um, after she'd finished her degree, she thoroughly enjoyed it and she got a part-time job in, one of the, in this global uh, uh, clothing chain. Yeah. And, um, this is my comparator because I got a few mates in the military and they said to me, oh, you're talking about well-being, you've got to read from defeat to victory. It's all about the Burma campaign. And essentially, in the Burma campaign, we were losing the war. People in this, some people in this room might, might know of this, this um, story. And the, the sort of view was that our people had lost their courage, they'd lost their will to fight, which they had, because they weren't engaging the enemy. And um, they sent out somebody to try and fix this. And what that person found was that there were more people, three times as many people dying of dysentery, malaria, minor injuries than Japanese bullets. And they decided there were three things that kept a soldier moving forward. And I think this is very similar in the clothing shop, in Starbucks, or in the police service. One is adrenaline. The second is camaraderie. If this person's going, I'll go. We've all been there with adrenaline and camaraderie, believe you me, haven't we? People do amazing things because of adrenaline and camaraderie. Well, the third thing that the British Army had forgotten was a realistic expectation that if I fall, my country will be there to support me. And because they had not got good health care at the front line, people saw that people were dying of avoidable diseases and injuries. Fast forward to Black Friday in Edinburgh at this clothes shop where my daughter's got a job and she's been promoted to supervisor. It is an adrenaline junkie's dream, this place on Black Friday. All these kids are just maxing out. It, so they're, they're buzzing with it. It's just madness. And also, they all get on with each other because they're all going to go out for a drink together. So there's a massive amount of camaraderie. When our daughter asked her manager, 
at five o'clock on Black Friday, probably three hours before the store closed, I've just found out my grandmother probably has the weekend to live. Can I leave early? She's dying of dementia. The store manager said, no. No, you can't. You should have told me yesterday. And at that point, they lost the one thing that every organization should recognize as its lifeblood, discretionary effort. Discretionary effort is the thing that you cannot order people to do, you can't pay them. If you cannot ask people to put themselves in harm's way, go above and beyond, you cannot performance manage it. But people will withdraw it. There are more staff stealing stock from that store than the canny shoplifters that you're chasing around Edinburgh every day. That is what happens on the worst case scenario when you do not you break that psychological contract. And it is very easy to break, so we shouldn't take it for granted. So I'm going to talk about first proposition now. Um, Deming said that, you know, in God we trust, all others bring, must bring data. And I've become a bit of a data obsessive person, actually, in my older age, because opinion is interesting, isn't it? But data, research, uh, changes people's opinions, and it changes policy and legislation as well. Uh, I'm led to believe that, you know, policing sort of prides itself on being good at handling data. We collect information from various different sources, from informants on the street through to public health data. You know, I remember when I was on the command course at Tully Allen, um, Sahari Burns talking, it fundamentally shifted my thinking about how public health data, all the stuff, Niven Rennie, the VRU, the stuff you do up here around seeing the big picture around ACEs and trauma-informed practice um, we're good at that stuff but what has happened is we have started we, we are victims of being overwhelmed by the amount of data in the system because we sometimes see data as an end in itself rather than a means to an end so I'm reg reli reliably informed that the global data sphere has reached 33 zettabytes anybody know what a zettabyte is it's a lot yeah it's more than your iPad's gonna cut that was in 2018, 33 zettabytes, all right? By 2025, there's gonna be 175 zettabytes. This is very worrying, isn't it? A zettabyte is a trillion gigabytes. Now, I'm sure my iPad was 14 gigabytes, I can't remember. But that is a lot of data, isn't it? And the, the, the problem is, it is going up like this, at a, at least a 45 degree angle. In our systems, that data is flooding through and we are awash with data. So what are we doing about it? We basically have record management systems which in their day, and they are critical to what we do, they store, they help us store crimes, uh, incidents, other, other types of data through to actually investigations and files. But these record management systems were never built to withstand this data load that we're putting through them. Uh, but forces are starting to look at voice analytics, customer relationship management systems, and the sort of things that the private sector have had to accelerate and have been tried and tested for 10 years. In my old force, we had 1.3 million phone calls a year, but 50% of them were voice only. They were not data. And to, to know what was in them, you had to listen to them. It is now possible through voice analytics, when we run that through that data, you can see a huge amount of opportunity to remove both failure demand and improve service to the victim. But from my perspective, the win-win is this is non-value, low-purpose work for our staff. Nobody minds being busy if it's purposeful work, but this, is if this stuff flows through into the parade room and office of our people and gets in the way of them achieving their purpose. And we're talking in, in out of 1.3 million calls, at least 300,000 plus were total failure demand. Most of them are people calling us for an update on the crime. You know, so, um, and I think, is Ben Bradford here? Where's Ben? Ben, I'm not stepping onto your territory now because you're an expert in the area of do the public want us to use more technology, aren't you? And I had a very interesting talk I'm summarizing, you know, your area of expertise there, so forgive me, but 
you know, I heard you talk very eloquently about this recently. I think there still is some suspicion of us adopting some of these technologies and perhaps there's some public suspicion around it. My argument will be that um, machines actually, for some of the work that we do, are far less fallible than the poor old humans that are out there at three o'clock in the morning. So if you think about an operational scenario of a young officer that's probably got two years service um, and they're out at three o'clock in the morning, they've stopped a car with three people on, which we want them to do, hopefully, because that is a car that could be um, doing something uh, of criminal activity. We now know that we didn't know 10 years ago, we sort of intuitively knew it, but we didn't know it for fact, that up to one in five police officers have got undiagnosed PTSD or complex PTSD. That's independent research by Cambridge University. We've just done a sleep study uh, with a cohort of police officers with Washington State University and Surrey University. 50% have got a diagnosable uh, sleep disorder, one of the four sleep disorders. We've got people who 65% of police officers reporting getting regular less than five hours sleep a night. So fatigue, trauma exposure, and on top of that, we have got financial data that says that 38,000 police officers and staff in England and Wales, after all outgoings at the end of the month, have got 150 pounds spare. And that's before inflation went up and the cost of living crisis. So we've got this individual out there. They're trying to hear what's going on through the earpiece, probably getting about 40, 50% of it. And they're also trying to look at the cues of the people, spot things that aren't right, wrongly, Malcolm Gladwell will probably say, because they're looking at it from their cultural perspective, not the, the individual in the car. And they need data that matters. And the amount of data in the system that we can give them, the information that's useful, is very limited. Yeah? So what happens and how does that affect their decision making? At best, they will make a risk-averse decision and create even more non-value work because they're worried about getting it wrong. Um, at worst, far worse, they will stop stopping cars. They will stop arresting people and they will stop going to the incidents that we need them to go to because how they feel is that, uh, uh, that they know full well that there is a huge cloud full of data that at nine o'clock in the morning, if they've made the wrong decision, people like me will come on and be duty bound to go through with a fine tooth comb and say, why did you miss this? And that is organizational justice in a very, very specific um, everyday activity that our people are doing. And the importance of doing the research that we do, it's only matched by the employee voice work that we do getting the information from the lived experience of people right at the front end to find out just how they're feeling about things like that. And that is what drives us to be better, doesn't it? So every year we do a survey that picks up all these issues uh, based on organisational justice and it picks up feeling supported, it feels that intention to quit. Intention to quit is never quitting in the police. Very rarely is it quitting so far in the police. It is an indicator that people are removing discretionary effort. They do not quit, they remove effort, which is, seems invisible, but as I've said, it is not. It's actually something that's even more worrying than people leaving. So when people say to me, oh, I'm worried about retention rates and turnovers going up, I actually think, is that as big a problem as we think it is? Maybe if this job isn't for people and we can support them through that into other jobs, maybe in policing, it is better than them staying and becoming ill. Because we do get that a lot, you know, people do have high levels of pride. And of course, where we see high levels of pride, if any of you people in this room do a job that you don't care about, if somebody puts things in the way of you doing that job, you're not that bothered. But if you've got 93% pride in your work, which our people report they have, you do something like introduce new technology, a new process, or treat me unfairly, and put things in the way, it will drive me to distraction, and it will make me ill, yeah? And so, it's a good thing. We, it's fantastic we've got these people that care, 
but it means we've got to tune up what we do because they are not just making coffees, these people. Um, I think the whole idea of person-centric strategy, you know, we hear this talked a lot, don't we, personalization. One of the things that we, um, I will argue for, is that we need to uh, adopt a very person-centric approach to this issue in policing. Outside of D, uh, DEI, mental health is probably one of the most contentious, sensitive subjects that we can talk to our people about. And I think one of the things that I really want to do is help what, what I didn't have in my service was awareness of some of the technological solutions out there that can help us get better at this. And one that I'm particularly interested in is wearable technology. So, the Swedish techno geeks. The Swedish techno geeks are implanting technology into their bodies that reads bodily functions, gives them a microchip to pay for their Starbucks and everything. And when you look actually at how we have adopted technology and integrated into our bodies, machines into our bodies for physical health, pacemakers, you know, for deafness, for blindness. We've, we've made massive strides in this, but we are now starting to see people experiment and do research around how we can track people's mental health with wearable technology, with proxy measures. And we're doing some pilots around this, and I find this a very exciting um, innovation that we should wholeheartedly embrace in terms of researching what its benefit could be for policing. So let me, let me sort of um, talk about it in this way. When you join the police now to when I joined, your physical protection is on another level. I think we'd all agree that. You know, you used to turn out in your shirt sleeves, didn't you, and buy your own boots and all this sort of stuff. You're weighed down with kit now. So physical protection has massively improved, and quite rightly so. It's the same on building sites. There are far less um, industrial accidents on building sites now, but the main killer of construction workers is suicide. And the main thing now that we are seeing, the health and safety executive, all the people who are doing analysis around mental health in the workplace, is physical illness has been overtaken by mentally, mental illness. So what are we doing for our new recruits, knowing what we know now, to protect their minds like we protect their bodies with a stamp vest? And I think wearable technology, preparing new recruits in terms of mental health and resilience training, and lots of other things that we can do, I'll talk about in a second, are, are going to be things that we will, it, well, either we adopt them voluntarily and embrace them, or we will be, you know, we'll be put into a position of having to um, put these, ad adopt these new technologies, um, almost like in hindsight. And I think we should embrace it positively. I'd like to see wearable technology that provides you with proxy measures for you, you know, so we help you understand what your body's telling you about stress, fatigue, alcohol consumption, yeah, the day you get your stamp vest. So we're putting, we're putting a protection in there for the mind as well as the body. And I think somebody described to me the other day that um, Domino's Pizza is a technology company that makes pizzas. I think you were at the same thing there, Ben, weren't you, when somebody said that? Yeah, I thought it was really good, that. And, you know, people, you know, he's probably going to have a go at me now, Ben, because I sort of think, well, why is it that, you know, I can order a, de a delivery and I can, or an Uber and I can see the car coming, but we still can't see a police car coming if we're, you know, waiting for that to arrive, or an ambulance and all these other things that we've got. You know, we, we, we are not in a competitive environment, so, you know, we can be forgiven for not investing in these technologies. But I really quite like seeing my pizza being made online. Do you know what I mean? And I'd quite like to be able to get an update on my crime as well, if I had one. And so I think there are certain things that we can't do in policing because they're too sensitive. But I think there is a huge amount of that 300,000 uh, failure demand in my old force that is just about knowing where you're up to with my shed being broken into, which is quite simple to get um, into these technologies. Now, as I've said before, the second area I'm going to talk about is how need has changed. And this is sort of my final section, so your haggis is nearly here. And, um, you know, I'm married to a psychotherapist, which um, is uh, an interesting... Any psychotherapists in here? I haven't got any NLP people. I haven't got any psychotherapists, right? Because you can't have an argument with a psychotherapist. It's impossible. Everything's about where did the question come from. But what I've learned from uh, observing my wife's study 
and her practice, I, I think we have a lot to learn. First of all, most of our client groups and you know, a lot of people I've worked with say, hold on a minute, we don't call them client groups, the callers or the victims or the offenders, but I'll use that phrase just to get across the point, have got complex needs. Yeah, 80% of our demand now is dealing with complex need demand. And those professions that have been dealing with complex need demand for 50, 60, 70 years, the way they've developed evidence-based practice is they've put process in place to put the brakes on how working with people with complex needs can affect your attitudes, your beliefs, and your behaviors. And I challenge anybody to say that a new recruit off the street into policing doesn't very quickly start, their brain starts to adapt to the environment they're in. It's, it's, there are bad people who work in policing, we've seen that recently, but I'm talking about the vast majority of good people who join the job with the right intention. The impact of their experiences, and we can prove this with the research that we've got, starts to change how they see the world. And some of how they see the world, we reward and recognize because it's the copper's nose, it's the gut instinct, it's that, it's that split second thing that doesn't quite look right that might save a life, but there's a flip side to that. And it can manifest itself in pejorative, pessimistic, personal, yet permanent outlooks about people and communities. And it can. And it is a brain function. And we do not do anything in policing specifically to put the brakes on that. But there are some really encouraging signs that we're starting to use trauma debriefs, supervision sets that you would see in um, therapeutic circles to basically help people post their experiences. There is a double win for me in that. One is it's great for their mental health, but there's also a massive win for the public because it puts the brakes on some of the attitudes and behaviors that we have seen in policing and culturally we see sometimes as the norm because it is the way, the way the brain adapts to the environment they're in. And you know, we are not there yet with the neuroscience behind this, but there is some fascinating research going. It's the same as many of you people in this room will understand ACEs, trauma-informed um, practice, trauma-informed care. We all share the same brains. And I think there are opportunities there for us to <coughs> emulate some of the caring professions and interestingly, uh, Devon and Cornwall Police have just done uh, a load of psychological risk assessments where they've compared uh, response officers to other officers. So I think response is one of the highest risk roles just because of the age profile, the nature of the work. It's very, very um, unpredictable. And they have found that those people have got exactly the same levels of home-related stress, but they've got very different levels, response officers, of work-related stress. So the load on top is higher in certain roles than it is in others. Now, this gets me to the point of whose job is it to sort this out? You know, because if people's home life is causing them stress, what is it to do with the employer? Well, we're starting to see now some research and some studies coming through, which actually proves the point that a lot of people have got similar stresses at home, but what we do in work, the hindrance stresses the organizational stresses are avoidable and they are something the organization should own and do something about. And so looking at the sort of things that we can do to remove non-value work, unfair processes, all that organizational justice piece has now found its way onto the police covenant um, that's very new. It only got royal assent on the 28th of April, but it is an enduring issue and it's a wicked problem to try to remove this stuff and we better start doing it quick because there's, as you, you're removing some of it, more of it's flooding in the other end. And hindrance stress now we can prove with our national survey, this is independently done by Durham University. It is driving every single negative indicator of well-being that we track. We've done three years so far, 36,000 responses, statistically significant, it's leading to negative impacts on intention to quit, feeling valued by the organization and the public, work-related stress, um, fatigue, <coughs> everything basically. 
So um, we need to adopt new technologies and we need to have a, a leadership and a management shift in terms of looking at how we can focus on and start talking about some of these things that are actually getting in the way of us doing the job. Now, I'm going to show a video now, just to finish off, because um, one of the things that we try to do is uh, be provocative, and we found a, a documentary maker called Chris Godwin, who wins awards for doing very high-impact documentaries about lived experience. So he'll work with the health service to do a documentary about dementia care that is shown to staff to get across to them how it feels for somebody to be caring for somebody with dementia or, or live with dementia, to provoke a discussion with those staff about how the video leaves them feeling. And we've done a video uh, with him. This is a short excerpt, it's a trailer, um, to depict our priority work streams um, in the wellbeing service are around assaults, trauma, fatigue, financial stress, bureaucracy, and this video um, basically depicts a new recruit uh, as they go through many of those experiences. So we're just going to play that now. As soon as you put the knife down. Come on then. Show us your warrant card. Why did you join up? I said I'd do it. You don't need to worry, Alfie. Stop there. Want to see the bruising, eh? You can't look at it, can you? Why did you want to make a release of this? for dramatic effect with the uh, piano. Um, that, that video, we are the extended, it's only eight, nine minutes long, the extended version, we're wrapping a, a therapeutic safe practice around it because we intend to show that to new recruits when they're training, tutor constables, sergeants, inspectors, uh, because I've talked about a lot of things here tonight, but the one thing that I think will is the saddest thing that I sometimes see, and I've felt myself in policing, is losing a sense of purpose and meaning. It's an incredibly important job that policing does for society. Um, that's why we're all here tonight, isn't it? This is why, um, you know, James Smart all those years ago wanted deeper and wider thought into policing. It is pivotal. And I think if we, you know, we, we could stray into changing significantly the way this country is policed if we don't start paying attention to some of these issues. Because if our staff feel under threat, they will quite rightly demand more protection. They will want to meet force with force. And if anyone's ever been stopped by a car in the US or anything like that, if that were to come to this country, I think people will be, see a significant shift in the way this um, society works in this country. So in summary, the, the video shows um, a, a young guy, just happens to be Scottish actually, he's a very good actor as well, Alfie, um, who's got aces. He comes into the job, things start to get on top of him, the drip, drip, drip effect, and we cannot underestimate this. I was at the Federation Conference last week, and I, I often end up in situations where I'm the person who everybody turns to you hear all the bad stories, you go, what are you doing about it? And, you know, that's part of my role, and it has been for 10 years around mental health. And there were some very high-impact uh, talks from officers. 
in, in, you'll remember, many of you, the murders of um, you know, um, Fiona Bone and Nicola Hughes, two GMP police officers by Dale Cregan, two horrendous murders. Four officers off that shift have since taken their life. And one of those officers who, one of the officers who didn't take the life spoke about how it was the organisational processes that almost pushed him to suicide. It was being put on half pay. It wasn't the fact he was on half pay, it was the way it was done. And when we come back to what our responsibility is, we've got to look at the lived experience of these people, just like we have to look at lived experience of vulnerable people in the community and take a trauma-informed approach. That's all it is, it's the same principles. Um, and so um, I hope tonight what I've got across to you is that um, research makes a difference. Um, accelerating research into practice is not easy, as you know, um, but it is happening. And it is happening because there is a movement and a groundswell and a generation change coming to all organisations that wants a different conversation around mental health and wellbeing. And its expectations are very high. And I think actually we, I, I sit around with a lot of private sector organisations. We, we do okay in the police with this, given the nature of the job that we do. And I've got a friend of mine, he leads wellbeing in John Lewis's. Great company. And they are piling money into this in John Lewis's. And I say to him, it gets busy in John Lewis's. You're selling kettles. Do you know what I mean? Some of this stuff is difficult work. It's most difficult work you'll, you'll ever see people doing. So they deserve our best. And I think, just to reassure you, that the work that you do in SIPR and other universities and other people that are doing research across the globe is starting to have a massive difference. And it's changing significantly the way that our people see their organisations, do the job and protect the public. Uh, so thank you for inviting me here tonight. I will get out of your way while you now can get stuck into your haggis and the Kaylee. But thanks for the patience to listen to me. Uh, I hope that's been informative. Thank you.